Closed captioning for Lift Up Jesus is paid for by our friends at Galpin Ford of Los Angeles. I'm Kayla Francis, and if you're thinking I look vaguely familiar, it's because Pastor Dudley, host of Lift Up Jesus, is my dad. For a long time, I've had a heart for reaching women, particularly women who dream about having the talent, the position, and the passion for influencing this culture. And that's why we launched the LA Conference for Women Who Influence. This year's theme is Chosen, and I believe that this event could be your chance to step into your calling and become everything God has designed you to be. Join us on Saturday, September 21st, right here at Shepherd Church in Los Angeles. We have an amazing lineup joining me, including Carrie Champion, Crystal Evans Hurst, Dudley Rutherford, and even an exclusive video interview with Christine Kane. For more information and to register, please visit us online at shepherdchurch.com slash influence. This could be your moment to reach the next level in your career and your calling. Register today. I would not be a good shepherd if I did not mention that we as a church, both men and women, should always stand for life. We should protect life. We should defend life, especially the life of the unborn. Hello again and welcome as we lift up Jesus with Pastor Dudley. I'm Michael North. We're happy you've joined us today as we continue our series, The Power of One. We're looking at the most unlikely individuals in the Bible who took a bold step and allowed God to work through them to make a difference for others. Does that sound like you? We believe that someone watching this program right now is the next person who could be called by God for a very special purpose. Maybe that purpose could be to help a child in need. This is Foster Care Weekend here at Shepherd Church. As he did with his congregation, Pastor Dudley is encouraging all our viewers today to prayerfully consider becoming a foster parent. Throughout our program today, you will see information on your screen of the many organizations that are dedicated to foster care and placing children into loving homes in the Los Angeles area. Those of you watching nationwide will likely have similar organizations in your city as well. We encourage you to consider connecting with them and help make a difference in one child's life today. We know God will bless you for it. Let's join Pastor Dudley now as he continues with our series, The Power of One. Today, I wanna to talk to you on this subject, the daughter, everybody say the daughter. I want to talk to you about a, a lady and her little basket, okay? And what we're talking about, we're looking at the Bible at people, just little people that you would never know just looking at them, but God used them to have incredible influence in the world, even in the world today. And uh, we're going to look at one of those amazing stories. But our theme this year is I love LA. And whenever you see that in our publication or promotion, you always see quotation marks, like it's a quote. And what we, what we want is for you to imagine God saying those words. God saying, I love LA, because God does love LA. Jesus loves LA. The Holy Spirit loves LA. And we as the church should love this city, amen? amen. So throughout the, this year, I don't know if you've noticed, we're setting aside certain weekends to highlight specific ways, specific ways that we as a church can love this city and make a difference in this city. For example, two weekends ago, uh, we hosted a concert here called Mi Casa LA, where we raised funds for a homeless shelter here in the San Fernando Valley. There's two million people who live in this valley and we have a, a, high, a large number of homeless people, and the number one rescue mission in the valley is called Hope of the Valley. 
led by Ken Kraft. So we hosted this concert here, took up an offering, we raised funds, we sold tacos, and all the proceeds went to Hope of the Valley. Two weekends ago, this church, we raised $160,000 to help make a difference in this city, and, and we did, and we are. Can you say amen? amen? So this weekend, we want to highlight children who need to be adopted, orphans who need to be cared for, uh, babies who need to be rescued. For those in the foster care system and the underprivileged who live here in Los Angeles who need to be loved. And there are many ways that you can be involved, which I will explain as we go through this, but in your notes, in your sermon notes, I want you to write this down. There's 140 million orphans around the world. It's hard to get our arms around that number. In the United States of America, there are close to 400,000 orphans. It's hard for us to get our arms around that. But here in Los Angeles, there are 30,000 children in the foster care system. I don't know about you, but I think we can start to get our hands around that a little bit. Each and every one of those 30,000 children deserve our best effort and support. <laughs> Ephesians 1, I want you to see these two verses, verse, chapter 1, verse 4. He, God, the Bible says, chose us in Him before the what? I want you to think about this. Before God ever created this world, He knew that you would be here and He knew that I would be here. And He chose us before the creation of the world to be holy and blameless in His sight. Verse 5 says that in love, God predestined us to be adopted as His sons through Jesus Christ in accordance with His pleasure and His will. If I had asked you before you walked in here, were you adopted as a child? Most of you would have said no. But after reading verse 5, where it says that God in love predestined us to be adopted as his sons, all of us would raise our hands that are in Jesus Christ, being thankful that God has added us or adopted us into his family. Number one in your notes, and this is the first point, we who belong to Christ, those of us that are saved, if you're here today and you believe in Jesus, we are the rescued, adopted children of God. That is an amazing thought, that every one of us have been adopted by God. In fact, I will say this, that the entire Bible is a book about adoption. This is an adoption book. There's a heavenly Father, God, who looked down upon a bunch of wayward misfits and God decided to love us unconditionally and so he adopted us as wayward as we were he chose to adopt us and to call us his sons and his daughters we've all gone here from rags to royalty none of us are naturally born of God all of us are adopted all of us have been rescued Galatians 1 4 says that Jesus gave himself for our sins to rescue us. God rescued us here today. We were lost, and God rescued us. Colossians 1 13, for he, God, has rescued us from the dominion of darkness. And the Bible says that he just brought us. We didn't deserve it. He just brought us into the kingdom of the Son that he loves. Galatians 4, verses 4, 5, and 7, God sent His Son to redeem those under the law that we might receive the full rights of sons. So you're no longer a slave, but a son. And since you are a son, God has made you also an heir. That thought alone would cause me to come down to the front and give my life to God right there, knowing that He wants me to be an heir to His throne. The gospel is all about adoption, and Jesus paid the price for our adoption. He went to the cross to rescue us, and every person here again who is a believer 
You are the rescued adopted children of God. Now, my second point is the church. And in case you don't know who the church is, that's you. I just want to make that clear. That, that the church is, I want you to circle the word is, just circle it. That the church is God's plan. That is God's plan to rescue the 140 million orphans around the world. God wants the rescued to become the rescuers. He wants the adopted to become the adopters. Over and over again, God tells us in his word that we as Christians are to care for the orphans. That is God's plan. That is God's strategy. Isaiah 1 verse 17, uh, the Lord says, listen, uh, he said, learn to do what's right. Seek justice. Encourage the oppressed and defend the cause of the fatherless. Statistics are unbelievable when it comes to children growing up without a father. I think today in the United States of America, we have 17 or 18 million children growing up in fatherless homes. 63% of youth suicides come from fatherless homes. 90% of homeless and runaway children come from fatherless homes. 85% of children who show behavior disorders come from fatherless homes. Now, my children had a father, and all three of them had behavior disorders. I just want you to know that. <laughs> I'm just saying. 85% of all youths that are incarcerated come from fatherless homes. James tells us in James 1.27 that religion, everybody say religion. religion. Religion that God our Father accepts as pure and faultless is this. Our job is to look after orphans and widows in their distress. To whom is God giving these commands? Well, he's giving these commands to the church, to the people of God, to you, to me, to us, to Shepherd Church. God has an incredible amount of love for children, especially children who've been abandoned. Perry Hancock painted this picture. He said on one side, you have a, he said, I want you to picture 140 million orphans, if you can just see them. 140 million orphans around the world. And over here, I, I, I want you to picture the love of God, the heart of God, the compassion of God. And he said the question is how are we ever going to reach or explain to 140 million orphans, how are they ever going to know the love of God? And he said the only way that those orphans will ever understand the heart of God and the love of God is he said we have to build a bridge. And he said the bridge, and I hope you're paying attention, the bridge is not the government. The bridge is not society. The bridge is not the school system. The bridge is not a new resolution by the president. The bridge is the church. We are the bridge between those orphans and the heart of God. In Los Angeles, there are 30,000 children in the foster care system. Only 58% of those children will graduate from high school. Only 3% of them will graduate from college. And more importantly, most of them will never know the love of God. If we, the church, fail to do what God has called us to do, all I'm saying is this. If you have been rescued by God, God desires to use you to rescue others. And if you have been adopted by God, God desires to use you to help reach others who need to be adopted. My third point, which is the most important point of this message, is that the one, everybody say one, the one helpless child that you rescue might end up being the one that God uses to save the entire nation. You don't know that the one child you help reach, help rescue, becomes the savior of the entire nation. I wanna to read to you Exodus chapter two, but before I read this, I wanna give you the context, and everybody say context, because if you don't understand the context, you might not really get the point of Exodus chapter two. The context is that the nation of Israel have been enslaved in Egypt. 
for 400 years. That's a long time to be a slave. In Exodus chapter 1, the Bible says that Israel was fruitful and multiplied, even though they were in bondage, and the Bible uses these words, they had become exceedingly numerous. And the king of Egypt, the great Pharaoh, he was afraid. He thought that the Hebrews would take over his country. And so he forces the Jewish people into hard and oppressive labor. Furthermore, in order to decrease their numbers, he orders, it's the law of the land, for the Hebrew midwives who deliver the Hebrew babies to kill every male child who was born and the Hebrew midwives would not do it so Pharaoh ordered not to give up he ordered his own people the Egyptian people he issued an edict in the land that any Egypt person person Egyptian who saw a Hebrew male child that you were to take that child and to throw him into the Nile River And in case you don't know this, the Nile River was crawling with crocodiles. Now imagine you're a woman and you're pregnant and you're Hebrew and you're living down in Egypt and you've been waiting for this baby for nine months. You don't know if it's a boy or a girl. And that child arrives and you see that it's a boy. How fearful you would live your life knowing that any Egyptian had the right and was actually had been commanded to take your child and to throw that child into the Nile River. Think about how you would feel. And it's that is the context as we read Exodus chapter 2. Are you with me? How many of you are with me? All right, Exodus chapter 2. There was a man of the house of Levi married to a Levite woman. And verse 2 says she became pregnant and she gave birth to a boy or girl. She gave birth to a son. Now we know her name is Jochebed. Everybody say Jochebed. We know that's the name of the mother from another passage in the Bible. So when Jochebed saw that this child, this son was a fine, the Bible says he was a fine child. In the Hebrew, it's the word tov. And and the word Hebrew word tov means good. And uh, it's the same word that God used in the story of creation in Genesis chapter 1 where God was creating the heavens, the earth, and he created, and he said it was good. And it was good. It was tov. It was tov. This woman, Jochebed, when she gave birth to this Hebrew boy, she said, it is tov. It is good. This is a good. This is a blessing of God. All children are a blessing of God. Uh, Even the ornery ones, I have to say. (laughs) And so she she saw that he was tov, and she, she hid him for three months. Why was she hiding him? Well, because the law of the land was any Egyptian who saw this boy had been commanded to take that child and throw it into the Nile River. So verse 3, when she could not hide him any longer, she got a papyrus basket for him and coated it with tar and pitch. And she placed the child in it and put it among the reeds along the bank of the Nile. And his sister, now we know from another text, that this boy's sister's name was Miriam. And Miriam is like a top secret agent. And uh, the sister stood at a distance to see what would happen to him. Verse 5, Pharaoh's daughter, and here's the story, the daughter in her basket. Uh, Pharaoh's daughter went down to the Nile to bathe. And her attendants were walking along the river bank, and she saw the basket among the reeds. And she sent her slave girl to go get it. And the girl, verse 6, she opened up the basket and she saw the baby and and, uh, he was crying and she felt sorry for him. And she said, this is one of the Hebrew babies. Now, how did she know it was a Hebrew baby? No. Not the blanket. It had been circumcised. Every Hebrew baby had to be circumcised on the eighth day. So she looked into that basket and she saw that it was a boy. She saw that it was a Hebrew baby. And so verse 7, then his sister, the secret agent, asked 
Pharaoh's daughter, shall I go and get one of the Hebrew women to nurse the baby for you? Yes, go, she answered. And the girl went and got the baby's mother. She went and got Jochebed. Verse 9 says that Pharaoh's daughter said to her, take this baby and nurse him for me and I will pay you. Ladies, how would you like to get paid to nurse your own child? (laughs) And verse 10 says, when the child grew older, she took him to Pharaoh's daughter and he became her son and she named him Moses, saying, I drew him out of the water. Now Moses, if you don't know the story, in Exodus chapter 12 becomes the deliverer of the nation of Israel. When he is 80 years old, he leads close to 2 million Hebrews out of Egypt, out of slavery. He who was delivered becomes the deliverer. He who was rescued becomes the rescuer. So the moral of the story is quite obvious. These women, these Hebrew midwives who refused to kill the male babies, and Jochebed, Moses' mother, and Miriam, Moses' sister, and even Pharaoh's daughter, all of them defy the king's edict to rescue one baby, one child, and that one child 80 years later, as a senior citizen, (laughs) becomes the one that God uses to set free, after 400 years of slavery, the nation of Israel. Oh, I applaud those Hebrew midwives for defying the laws of the land. I applaud Jochebed doing whatever it took to save her baby from Pharaoh's evil plot. I applaud Sister Miriam who valiantly braved and risked her own life to save the life of her baby brother Moses. And I applaud even Pharaoh's daughter who stood up against the laws and the commands of her own earthly father to save a baby of a different nationality than hers. And just in case you don't know this, Jesus placed a high value on children and protecting them. These are his words, not mine. Jesus said, whoever humbles himself like this child is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. Jesus said, and whatever, whoever welcomes a little child like this in my name welcomes me. And Jesus said, if anyone, I I don't care who you are, if anyone causes one of these little ones who believe in me to sin, why, why, it would be better for him to have a large millstone hung around his neck and to be drowned into the depths of the sea. Oh, Jesus and God placed incredible value on the lives of children and no person, I'll say no person, no man, no woman, no king, no president, no pastor, no doctor, no coach, no teacher, no person ever has the right to hurt a child. (laughs) To mislead a child, to abuse a child, or to take the life of a child, And when I think myself of the 50 million babies who have been aborted in this country since 1973, there's a couple of thoughts I have. One is how the heart of God must grieve. Uh, Your heart, my heart, think about the heart of God. How the heart of God must grieve. The second thought I have is I wonder how many of those babies that were aborted would have been the next Moses would have been the next Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., would have been the next Abraham Lincoln, would have been the next Billy Graham, would have been the next evangelist, the next preacher, the next missionary, the next doctor, the next president, the next rescuer, the next deliverer, the next difference maker in this country. I would not be a good shepherd 
If I did not mention that we as a church, both men and women, should always stand for life. We should protect life. We should defend life, especially the life of the unborn. Thank you for being with us today, and we encourage you to join us again next week as Pastor Dudley continues his message, The Daughter and Her Basket. We also want you to know that this entire sermon series called The Power of One is available right now on DVD. Here's how you can get yours. In today's distracted and networked world, we often forget the power of a single person. But with God, all things are possible, including one person's victory over any obstacle in your way. What's the challenge you're facing? What situation looks hopeless to you right now? Or do you feel alone? For the first time ever, the Lift Up Jesus team has compiled eight powerful teachings from Pastor Dudley Rutherford on the power of one. We've brought this once in a lifetime package together in a CD or DVD, as well as small group resources you can share with your Bible study or small group. For the gift of only $75 or more to help us continue sharing this life-changing message with the world, we'll ship your copy of The Power of One today. Each of us has the potential to influence and affect change in the hearts and lives of others when we're willing to be used by God. Call, write, or go online and order your copy today. I'm Kayla Francis, and if you're thinking I look vaguely familiar, it's because Pastor Dudley, host of Lift Up Jesus, is my dad. For a long time, I've had a heart for reaching women, particularly women who dream about having the talent, the position, and the passion for influencing this culture. And that's why we launched the LA Conference for Women Who Influence. This year's theme is Chosen, and I believe that this event could be your chance to step into your calling and become everything God has designed you to be. Join us on Saturday, September 21st, right here at Shepherd Church in Los Angeles. We have an amazing lineup joining me, including Carrie Champion, Crystal Evans Hurst, Dudley Rutherford, and even an exclusive video interview with Christine Kane. For more information and to register, please visit us online at shepherdchurch.com slash influence. This could be your moment to reach the next level in your career and your calling. Register today. Join us every week for another life-changing message from Pastor Dudley. You can visit us anytime on our website and discover the many resources available there to help you with your daily Christian walk. While you're there, please consider partnering with us to help support this ministry. Pastor Dudley has a burden to reach the entire world with the gospel of Jesus Christ. And we can only do that with your financial help. You can also connect daily with Pastor Dudley through many forms of social media. We thank you for being a part of this ministry and invite you to join us again next week at the same time. Remember, wherever you are and whatever you're doing, don't forget to always lift up Jesus. Jesus.